see you this morning. We are glad you're here at Faith Baptist Church. Good to have Dr. Jonathan Perry and his family with us today. We're glad if you don't know him, get to know them before you leave. Find your celebration hymnal. Let's stand together. 704 is our number, and it simply says, God will make a way. Let's stand together and sing it out. Brother Sellers will come pray with us and for us at the end of this good song, 704. We'll sing it two times, as unto the Lord. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see, and He will make a way for me, and He will be my guide. Oh, me closely to His side. away even when we don't see one let's pray together our father we're mindful today of how good you have been to us in making a way just for us to be able to be back in church in these coronavirus days we're glad for the doors to be open and we ask that you'd bless our time together of fellowship and worship that we might honor you and all that we do and say today and lord that our fellowship would be encouraging to each other and help us as we try and live a life that'll honor and glorify the lord jesus christ thank you for everyone's here including our visitors. And I just ask, Lord, that you'd bless. Good to see old friends. And I pray that you'd bless our time together in your house and around your word. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. All right. <clears throat> if you'd find the best hymn in the hymn book, and we'll sing that next, and you'll find that on page 705, and we'll sing all four stanzas, and then we'll make a few announcements at the end of this good song some, every song in the hymn book we won't sing when we get to heaven. This one, take my word for it, we'll sing it. Amen. 705, it is well with my soul. When the peace like a river
singing, that's good singing. It might not be well with our bodies. We might have to wear a mask and hazmat suits to Walmart. But it is well with my soul because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me. All right, just a couple of quick announcements. <clears throat> We've obviously entered the month of July. Patriotism will be our theme through the month, as you might would, uh, uh, might would guess. We've been talking about America. Miss, Miss Jinx didn't know what America was. We had to tell her what that was in Sunday school today. We've been talking about America and all the wonderful things that God has blessed us with here in our country. We'll do so throughout the month. Brother Sellers will be bringing some messages on that as well. We are 32 days away from school starting here at Faith Baptist Christian Academy. Some of you public teachers have less time than that to get ready. Don't really know what to expect until it gets here, but our plan is to start on August the 13th and have a normal uh, uh, school year. And um, we almost got to saw Dave Avery fall down the stairs, and that would we could have ended church right there, amen, and went home. Because nobody would have, we wouldn't have listened to the preacher for the rest of the day. But nonetheless, we got all these things going on. Remember to pray for each other and the, our nation as we continue to talk about and focus on um, our great country that God has blessed us with. Okay? Now, at this time, I'm going to have Miss Leah come and sing for us. Brother PJ will come and sing for us later. And then we'll have another song, a congregational, and we'll turn it over to our preacher. My father has a great big family and There are many children besides me And if you're wondering how he divides his time Just let me say I never stand in line Cause he loves me like I was his only child. I never felt such love before, and I could never ask for more. He loves me like I was his only child. God really loves me. Yes, he really loves me. He loves me like me best I so often say but then all my father's children feel that way he loves me like I was his only child I never felt such love before and I could never ask for more he loves me like only child God really loves me yes he really loves me he loves me like share something with you this morning I don't normally share on a Sunday morning but as you know since the coronavirus has been in we have not been passing the offering plate so in order to ensure that many of you will give afterward we have brought security on board here brother Earl 
Uh, you, some of you know back in 2016, I was preaching up in Ohio at the Heritage Baptist Church, Mogador, Ohio, right outside of Akron. And they gave me this gun. They even put a little Confederate flag on the side of it. They said, if hostilities ever break out between the Yankees and the Southerners, we want you to be prepared. Well, it's a mock gun. It don't really work. So maybe that's why they gave it to me. So this year I went back up a few weeks ago and preached again. gave me a pistol that would match my shotgun. So between Brother Earl and me, if y'all don't give a good offering, we're going to take one. We're just joking about it, obviously, but I thought I would share this with you. In a day when even this week something's come up about gun control. I believe in gun control. I think everybody should control their own guns. That's the way I feel about it. So I'm going to control mine, but I've got these up on display in my office, and many of you never come in there unless you're in trouble. So I don't want you to have to see them under those circumstances. But nevertheless, uh, if you'd like to hold this one afterward, believe me, that one is quite a mess to hold. This one is pretty easy. Now, if somebody for maybe Christmas would get me a holster to put this in, <laughs> it would be a nice gift to get your pastor, all right? But anyway, thanks, Brother Earl. But on a serious note, I do want to thank all of you. Our offerings really have not slipped in some cases, they've even been better. You folks have been real good about giving, and thank you. It's the fact that you're mindful of it, you're aware that it has to go on. Some of you have even come by, wrote a check, brought something by, and just been a real blessing to me and also to our church. So thank you uh, for your giving. I do want to encourage you, though, to come back. We have evening. We started back with all of our services, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. We're not doing Wednesday yet. But please come back on Sunday night at 6. Uh, we'll have a great time of fellowship then. Uh, obviously singing and preaching. The little kids come up and say their Bible verses. Many of our uh, audience, uh, adults and teenagers, they also say their Bible verse. So I'd like to encourage you to come and be a part of it. I think you'll be greatly blessed uh, if you do. So keep that in mind if you would. Pass the word around. Keep it on Facebook and everywhere else that we are back in church. And hopefully everything will get smoothed back out. We'll be back to a more normal setting both now and also in August when school starts. All right, and on a positive note, yesterday was a national holiday here at Faith Baptist because it was Miss Sellers' birthday, and she was 29. If you're wanting to know, 29 years old yesterday. So let's sing happy birthday to Miss Sellers and anyone else that I may have missed, Miss Jinx. Miss Parker had a birthday. She's also 29, so we thank God for her as well. Amen. Let's sing happy birthday to these beautiful young ladies. Amen. Happy birthday to y'all. Happy birthday to y'all. Happy birthday. God bless y'all. Happy birthday to y'all. Give them a hand. All right. God bless you. Let's stand together and we will find 510 and we'll sing one verse and then we will have our hand waving song to replace our hand shaking song, okay? Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. On the first verse, and then PJ's gonna come sing for us. We'll turn it over to our preacher. 510. <laughs> Señor 
right after you've waved heartily, if you'll take your seat. Thank you, Miss Lori, for good playing for us. Good to have her back today. And now Brother PJ is going to come sing for us, and then Brother Sellers will come preach to us today. Uh, the name of this song is I Will Stand. <clears throat> I'm going to try to make it through it. My voice is about like Brother Earl's is right now. Uh, I've sang it before, and I don't want to get too political, but uh, it's got a good message. At some point, you know, Christians have got to take a stand, and that's about where we are, I think, at, to some degree. So anyway. I see a people prone to think The truth is like an ocean wave Changing with the tide But for me there has to be An absolute, a center line And it's the word of God eternal The cornerstone of Christ I will stand upon the truth of Jesus He's the reason I'm alive, so how can I not live to make Him known? I will give my all and make it count with no shadow of a doubt. Who He is, who I am, I will stand. So when the battle lines are drawn And when the winds of change are strong And when the voices of this world They keep on saying wrong is right In the face of unbelief Of those who mock and criticize I will not back down or waver No, I will be a light I will stand Upon the truth of Jesus, He's the reason I'm alive. So how can I not live to make Him known? I will give my all and make it count with no shadow of a doubt. Who He is, who I am. a long time ago if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything and you got to be careful in this day and age we're living in thank God for people willing to take a stand brother Frank thanks for standing up and waving your Bible praise the Lord for that all right take your Bibles this morning turn to the book of first Peter chapter number two first Peter chapter number two for the message I want to begin reading in verse number 11 and read down through verse number 15 these are unusual days, to say the least, that we are living in. I said, if you'd have told me a year ago it would be like this in America, I would not have believed you. And certainly, if you go back 5, 10, 20 years ago, 
none of us would believe this, these situations would ever have happened. And we're not just talking about the uh, virus, we're just talking about all the upheaval that happens on the political, the social, and the religious side of things in the day in which we're living. We're living in a different America than I grew up with. I sort of described a little bit of my America last week, and I won't go into all those details this week, but I grew up in a different America than what you're seeing now. I happen to think the one I grew up in was a better choice than some that's going, now again, I like the technological advances that we have today, and I'm all for them. But at the same time, I think we need to get back to some of our good, moral, and godly roots that we had a long time ago. And so I'll try and deal with some of that in the message this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, and beginning in verse number 11. If you found it in your Bible, would you say amen? amen. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which you, they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I'll stop the reading right there, but I want to share with you today about being a Christian American. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have to share it. Bless our hearts today. Open not just our ears to hear a man speak, but open our hearts to hear your Holy Spirit speak to each and every one of us. If there's one here today that is unsaved, I pray that today would be the very day of salvation for them. For Christians who need to be drawn back closer to you, I pray, God, you'd work in their life and stir us, move us, that we might be the Christian Americans and take our stand like we should for you in this country we live in. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I don't know if you realize or not, but we're living in a hyphenated country. By that I mean everybody's got a hyphenated name now. We have African, hyphenation, American, Arab, American. We have Asian American, European American, Latin American, Native American, Chinese American, English American, Filipino American, German American, Greek American, Cuban American, Irish American, Italian American, Japanese American, Jewish American, Korean American, Mexican American, Polish American, Redneck Americans. We got all kinds of American. We live in a hyphenated society in which we substitute a hyphen or a dash right in there. Now listen to me, very important of what I'm about to say. You can be born an American, but you cannot be born a Christian American. In order to be an American, you can be born on American soil and you're an American by birth. But in order to be a Christian American, you must be born again. That is, you must know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So when I'm talking this morning about being a Christian American, I mean, first and foremost, Christian is first. For God's people, we should be his people before we brag about our Americanism, if you will. I love America. We had a great American uh, God and Country Day last week. We played to the flag. We sang American songs. We waved our flags. We stood up and sang God bless, God bless the USA. We did all those patriotic things. But first and foremost, we should be Christians. And I'm afraid sometimes we get the cart before the horse. But we've got to make sure that we are Christian Americans. Who and what is a Christian American? Well, I submit to you that a Christian American still pledges allegiance to the flag. A Christian American still stands and sings the Star Spangled Banner. A Christian American still waves old glorious Christian American, still respects our nation. A Christian American still loves America. A Christian American supports the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I don't know if you saw recently where one of those, uh, uh, his last name is Cuomo, I don't remember his first name, he's one of the CNN news guys, and he said something about all the protests that were going on in the country. He said, show me where it's written. Show me where it's written. You have to uh, you have to protest peacefully. And then somebody got on there and said, right here in the Constitution, it says you have the right to protest peacefully, not to go around burning everything down. Including, by the way, I saw on the news this morning early, that somebody drove their car into a church 
and then threw some kind of firebomb in there and tried to burn the church down. I mean, we're living in strange days. And I believe if you're a Christian American, you're not in favor. You understand protests. You understand everything ain't right. We got a lot of problems in America. America's got a lot of scars. She's got a lot of warts. She got a lot of things wrong with a lot of blemishes, a lot of failures, and a lot of flaws in her character. But I'd still rather be a Christian American than anything else in the world. A Christian American respects the law and respects police. A Christian American values our history as well as our monuments. And I know we've got some that might point back to an era some folks don't want to remember. But I'm telling you this, if we fail to remember history... We will repeat that history because before long another generation is going to come on the scene that doesn't even know what happened in our past. You know, if you could learn from your past, not just as a nation, wouldn't that be even good for us as individuals? Have, is there anybody here that made mistakes when you first got married? Some of y'all raise your hand. I know, but I'm not talking about getting married. So that's what y'all raised. I made a mistake when I got married. No, I'm not talking about that. But you made mistakes. You probably made mistakes financially. That you go back and say, man, if I had that money now, or if I'd have held on to that car. Oh, don't, let, don't get me started on it. I just never got rid of that thing. Anyway, think back to something. Uh, maybe your children. Is there something you said, man, if I could go back, I'd be, I mean, I, if I could go back, I'd do some things different. There's a lot of things we made mistakes from. But because we remember them, we learn from them. And that's sort of the whole idea. But I don't want to get ch uh, off on that. I would again say a, a Christian American also praise for the president and the leaders of our land. I didn't particularly like President Obama when he was in there for eight years, but I prayed for him. I really did. I prayed for him. I didn't want a truck to fall on him. I didn't want a building to collapse around him. I prayed for him. And then I prayed that America would survive those eight years, and God answered my prayer. We survived. Now then, let's get to the Bible. That's enough introduction. So you get the idea. We are hyphenated Americans, Christian Americans, redneck Americans, whatever you want to say, but we're Christian Americans. That's the fo focus of the message this morning. In the passage that I read you out of the Bible, there are a number of things I want you to see. The Apostle Peter, the same one who denied the Lord three times, the same one who said, even if it means i got to die, I'm going with you, that same one that made all those mistakes, got back on the horse again, if you will, got back in the saddle and made his life count for God, and he wrote this book of the Bible. And Peter wrote it, according to chapter number 1, to a bunch of Christians scattered throughout the Roman Empire some 2,000 plus years ago. And in doing that, he's trying to instruct them on how they live out those dual roles, Christian and American. We have American, that's our earthly side of things while we're here, but we have the Christian side, the heavenly side. So we sort of have an earthly country and a heavenly kingdom, and we got to somehow blend those two together. How do we do that? Now, I've seen some people go to one extreme, and they're really taken up with the Christian side of it, and they never think anything about America. They don't want to vote. They don't want to uh, be in the military. They're conscientious objectors. I think they've gone too far in one direction. Then there's others that don't want anything. Well, you can't have a church. Uh, you can't even pray at a football game at a public school. You can't have prayer in the public school. All that kind of stuff is going to the other extreme. You know, it'd probably be better if we just kept it out of the ditches and got in the middle of the road and found something that we could live with, somewhat of a compromise maybe, but where we take a stand and remain keeping both Christian and American values right out in front of us. So Peter writes to them to explain to them some things that they can do to emphasize this, and I think it has a message for us today. Three simple things this morning. The first one is, notice in this passage our connection with this country. Look at verse number 11. He said this, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. What does he mean by that? Well, those two words, strangers and pilgrims, have an idea of how we connect both with earth or down here in our country and how we connect with our citizenship that is in heaven. According to Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 20, the Bible says that our conversation, a word means citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for our Lord Jesus Christ to come again. In the near future, I hope to be preaching that message on the mark, not the mark of the beast, but the mask of the beast. I'm going to bring that message to you real soon. 
So since the masks are so prevalent today, I'll try and do that in the near future. But we are connected to heaven by faith in Jesus, and we're connected down here by the country that we live in. And for us, it's American. If you were from Spain, I would be preaching it about being a Spanish-American, but whatever. But the two words used here are strangers and pilgrims. The word strangers is the idea of a person in a strange land, not just a stranger, somebody I've never met, somebody I need to meet and greet and get to know them. It's the idea, like, for instance, if you were to travel from our country and you were to travel, let's say, to France, and you got to France, and while you're journeying there, here and there and everywhere, you're making that journey, you're not a citizen of France. You're just journeying through. You're a stranger to that land. And that's the sense that we are God's children. He treats us like we're His only child, as she sang earlier. People have asked me sometimes, maybe you're friends or associates or family ask you, of your children, do you have a favorite one? We have three children. I have a favorite. You know which one it is? None of your business. But we'll move on. Let them debate it. They all think they are. You know, and uh, everybody's pointing over to Chew over there, but and I don't know who. That is not, absolutely not him. But anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we're in a strange land. So we go to another country. We're a stranger there. I don't live there. I don't have citizenship there. I don't have a dwelling there. I'm just visiting that country. In that sense, we are God's children, His children. We are visiting, if you will, in this land. Because this world, the old hymn writer put it this way, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. The other word used there is pilgrims. Somebody that goes into another land and has to settle down. They're not from there. They don't really fit there, but they have to settle there while they're living. Well, we've got to settle here. We have to learn to get along with the way things are. We've had to make adjustments. We've had to deal with the COVID-19. We've had to make adjustments with masks. We've had to make adjustments with schedules. We have to deal with restaurants and churches and schools being closed down. And we've had to be settled enough to not that let that rattle our faith in God or our country. And some people think, well, this keeps going. We're just going to lose America. Uh, if we lose America, it'll be our own fault. But I think she's worth saving, and I think the Lord's going to bring us through this. And I've got my faith and my hope in Him, not in Trump or anybody up in the White House or the Houses of Congress. Our connection with this country is we are connected here as strangers and we are pilgrims. And the idea is simply this, that while we're here, and Peter's making this point, he says, you're strangers and pilgrims, which means this, we're not supposed to fit in this world. When society goes in a negative, ungodly direction, we ain't supposed to tag along behind it. When the world goes down morally, we as Christians are not supposed to go down with it. We're supposed to keep our morals, our standards, and our level of character and living in an, up to a level that will honor the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us. I think we all understand that. But the point he's making is this, is this is not your home. We get tied down so much here. We think everything depends on, and I, again, I think the election's important. I think things that are happening in society are important. But I'm here to tell you today as God's people, we ought to be looking first and foremost to the Lord and to His Word and realizing that our hope is not in the things down here. Our hope is in the things up there. Titus chapter 2 said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave Himself for us. Jesus is coming back again. That's our hope, not what's happening down here. So we have a connection here. I don't want to lose my connection. I want to remain a citizen of America. I love our country, but I want to first be a Christian that realizes this. This ain't my home. I'm not going to get so settled here that I fit in, that I act and talk and behave. Do you know we're living in an age when Christians have adopted the vocabulary of the world? We use words that are cuss words. I, I don't. Hopefully you don't. But there are people that do. They grab the vernacular. They grab the vocabulary of the world. And they hear it on a movie. They sit in a TV program. They listen to it in their music. And it's using God's name in vain. And every four-letter bomb that you can drop is out there. And our society has picked up that garbage. I'm here to tell you this morning, we don't belong here. You wouldn't use that language in heaven. 
You wouldn't use that language if Jesus came over to visit. Frankly, I'll tell you this. Some of you wouldn't use that language that you use around your own children if the preacher came to your house. Well, yeah, but if you came, that'd be something special. No, something special is that if you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you and is living at your house. And you ought to be real careful. I wonder if Jesus came to our door. You probably heard that before. If he came to your door and he knocked and you saw him out the window, would you hurriedly hide some magazines? Would you turn the television off? Is there something in the house you would hide because you don't want him to see it? We're strangers and pilgrims here. We don't fit. Let's stop adopting all the conversation and the attitudes and the lifestyles of all the rich and famous that are out there. Hollywood and the stars out there are not your example to follow. The Lord Jesus Christ is the example to follow. I read the story this week of a lady who was it was a dream she actually had. And she dreamed that Jesus came and knocked on her door. And she went to the door and she opened it up. And standing there in, at, at her door was a scraggly, emaciated weakling there in just filthy, nasty clothes. And she said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. She said, you're not the Jesus I know. And he said back to her, no, but I'm the one that people see in you. You are exhibiting the wrong kind of Christ-like attitude because she had started living more like she belonged here than that she belonged there. A second word comes to my mind in this, and that is our conduct in this country. Notice verse 11 and 12. He actually says at the end of verse number 11, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. And I won't read the rest of it, but you can read the rest of it in just a moment. What he's talking about are two things there. One is abstinence abstain, you see that word in verse number 11? That means to voluntarily refuse to do or participate in. That's the whole idea of it. To voluntarily have restraint. To take the bridle, if you will, of the horse and pull back on it. Except in this case, it's not the horse. We pull the bridle back on ourselves. We hold ourselves, I don't need to act like that. I don't need to talk like that. I don't need to go there. I don't need to behave that way. I don't need to be, this bad habit, I don't need my life. Hold back. So he's saying this, in order for us to exhibit a good testimony for Jesus, we've got to learn to hold back to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You might not see the damage it does to you or your children, but it's hurt sometimes. There are things we allow in our lives that hurt us on the inside, the soul of us, if you will. They're just, it's kind of chipping away at it, little by little by little. And we've got to learn to be able to pull that back, bridle back on the fleshly lust that war against the soul. Then he also adds the idea in verse number 12, having your conversation honest. I looked up that word honest. Now when I think of honest, I just think of somebody's going to tell the truth. But you know this much, you've got to be real careful about how honest. An ugly woman walks up to you and says, how do I look? Oh, you're ugly. I mean, you can't say that. Uh, Maurice might, but I don't know, you know, he's just laughing about it. But I mean, they, some, sometimes you have to be diplomatic. Well, I've never seen anybody like you. That's a good thing to say to somebody that's ugly, but I mean, they may think you are. I, you, you get the idea that you, could, you can't be too honest. You have to be careful how you say certain things. As a pastor, I have learned that over the years, put my foot in my mouth more times than I want to admit. You have to be careful how you say things. Don't you think my, somebody, I, I've had this happen. Here, look at my new baby. Isn't he pretty? Isn't she lovely? And you look in there, it looks like a little monkey. You like, I, no, no. What's wrong with your child? But you don't want to say that. You can't, you can't be completely honest. Nick Avery asked me one time, do you like me? And I said, yes. And I wasn't being completely honest. And I won't apologize per, uh, publicly for that right now. But the, I looked that word up. It means more than just simply telling the truth. The word is connected with being beautiful or attractive. So here's the idea. My conduct is to have some abstinence. I got to stop doing some things that are hurting me probably hurting other people around you, and hurts my testimony. i got to stop doing some things that are hurting my testimony because i got to be a good testimony for Jesus because I'm, an, I'm a Christian American. But then also it's the idea of being attractive. Do you remember when I was growing up, I can remember sometimes my mama and my grandma would say something like this when I left the house to go be around somebody and said, don't, don't you be ugly now. Or maybe I had to go talk to somebody and be pretty firm. Don't you be ugly. Now, she didn't mean my physical appearance because I was always a handsome child. She didn't, I don't know why y'all laughing at that. But anyway, I, I knew she was. She didn't mean my countenance, my face, or anything. She meant the way I acted toward other people. Don't you be ugly. But now we're more consumed with, don't you buy an ugly truck. 
that's a bigger deal now than it is uh, don't marry an ugly woman or whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of different things out there, but we understand the idea of ugly. Could I put that in this and say this much? Don't be an ugly Christian. Don't be an unattractive Christian. Don't be somebody that your children look at, your neighbors look at, your co-workers look at, and say, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be that. If that's the way a Christian acts, if that's what a Christian does, if that's how a Christian loves and respects their preacher, their church, their brothers and sisters in Christ, if that's what being a Christian dad is, I don't want to be one. We should be the kind of Christians that when folks look say, there's something there that attracts them, that is uh, honest, as this word means. Uh, I can remember, I'm a, bear with me now, I've I, I done a little bit of self-examination this week. When I was a, in probably elementary, well, look, probably junior high, junior high, early high school, guys would get around and girls in the school, they would rate them on a scale of one to ten. Well, you know, she's a, she's a nine, she's a ten, different things like that. Y'all remember them days? Now, some of you guys are getting real nervous right now. Because you know when you get home, your wife's going to say, who was you thinking about when Brother Sellers was talking about that scale? And I'm going to tell you the answer. Honey, I was thinking about you through the whole thing. I could not get your picture out of my mind. So feel free to lie about it. But anyway. But now, again, and they might be one or two that you thought, well, she's nine, she's ten, she's just a very attractive girl or something like that. But now, you know, if she was built like a linebacker, had a glass eye and walked with a limp, you probably gave her a one or a two. You understand what I'm saying? Well, let me ask this. Where would you be on that 110 scale as an attractive Christian? Not just where would somebody else put you because they don't know you. See, we, don't, we talk about masks. We put those masks on, but sometimes, even before we had those COVID-19 masks, a lot of people wore masks to church. They pretended to be somebody else at church. And that wasn't who they really were outside of the church building. You're here for an hour or two every week, but that ain't who you really are. Who you really are is how you act outside these walls. Are we attractive Christians? And finally, I'll give you this, and that is our contribution. Now, by that I don't mean giving. I'm not talking about the offering or taking the gun to get you to put something in the offering plate. But notice with me verse 13, 14, and 15. Submit yourselves. To every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. Verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing. So what's our contribution? It's not money. What is our contribution? It's our submission to the laws of the land that don't violate the Bible. It's our submission to those in authority around us as long as it doesn't violate the Word of God. It is our submission and willingness to do God's will. Now, I don't know if it's God's will for you to go to Africa as a missionary. I don't know if it's God's will for you to be a, an evangelist. I don't know if it's God's will for you to buy the next house you're looking at. I don't know. I don't know God's will about every detail of your life. Some of those things, you've got to find God's will for yourself. You've got to talk to Him. You've got to pray. You've got to ask God for His guidance. But I do know that it is the will of God that you and I behave ourselves in a manner that honors Jesus with well-doing, with submission to authority, as long as it doesn't violate the Word of God. That is, we are to respect the law and we are to represent our Lord Jesus Christ as best we can. The attitude of the day is, it ain't wrong if you don't get caught. But it is wrong. If you don't get caught, it's wrong because it violates the law or it violates God's word. By the way, our laws, most of them, are based upon the precepts outlined in the Ten Commandments given in Exodus chapter number 20. There is sin and there is spiritual apathy in America to the point that some have suggested maybe instead of America the beautiful, we need to be talking about America the pitiful. Because we've gone downhill. But I would submit to you this morning that in the middle of all the mess, if we will be the Christian Americans we're supposed to be, God can bring honor to His Son through our lives, and it's got to help our country go back in the right direction. Are you, what hyphenated version of an American are you? Now, you may have roots that are Jewish, you may have roots that are 
Irish, Chinese, Japanese, whatever it may be. You have, maybe they have roots that go back to Germany. I have no idea. But the most important ones are these. The Christian American values and roots. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Whether you're in this audience or you're just listening by way of Facebook, you need Jesus. Yeah, you, well, I need my finances fixed. I need my marriage fixed. There may be a lot of things you need, but you've got to start here. You need Jesus first. And then the other things will fall into place. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's stand quietly to our feet. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father, thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, and I pray that you would help us. Help us to clean up our lives, to go in the right direction, to put our faith in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just help our nation to be what it should be. Bless the leaders of our land from top to bottom, from the local level to the federal level. But Lord, bless our homes and families represented in our church today. Bless every dad here to be a better dad. Every mom here to be a better mom. If we'd just be that Christian American that we ought to be, help us. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory for what you do in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, our song leader is going to sing. The altar is open if you want to come forward and kneel here and pray. If you need to be saved, we'd be glad to take a Bible and show you how can you, you can know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you just need to commit yourselves afresh and anew to being the right kind of Christian that you ought to be. As he sings this morning, you come. sure to welcome Jonathan Perry. Good to see him again. And the rest of you, glad you're here. Please come back tonight at 6. I think you'll enjoy the services. Until then, you are dismissed. God bless you.